Pastor Mike tried to convey a message a few weeks ago in this house that basically is summed up in the idea that the spirit and the heart of giving is about love. And sometimes we put things out there, they are difficult to correlate with practical and daily actions and responses, but ultimately is a truth. We try to take biblical principles and we try to transcend the mundane mindset of religious thinking, rituals and rules and you do this just because and we don't even know why, but do it. Love seems to open up the heart and even when you don't know all the scriptures, somehow you seem to know instinctively that you are behaving in a way that pleases him. Love tends to give. Pastor Mark will bring it to the level of transcending just our activities or our theologies, the mindset that turns into a lifestyle of generosity. I would love to believe after all of these years that your learning how to give has gone into your home, has gone into your workplace, your community. That as givers, we're more than just the offering baskets or the tithe, the offering that belongs into the work of the ministry in his church. But it goes into everything we do, including the attitude of serving as opposed to just wanting to be served. Hopefully you are grasping these things. And for some of you who are new in the faith, we understand that there are those who sometimes can exploit these kinds of messages or sometimes come with ulterior motives. Quite frankly, I'm tired of apologizing for them because we have done that all these years just to make sure nobody, nobody thinks that we're in that category. Quite frankly, church, we're way beyond that. We're to the place where I think we all recognize that the Christian faith, the ethic of our belief system is undergirded by the concept of giving. Everybody with me, a scripture I think probably everyone knows in this room, I would like you to quote with me John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave. God is a magnificent and generous God, filled with a love we can barely comprehend. When you taste of it in your natural life, you will, as one of our pastors said, you will not be able to stop yourself from giving to whoever you love. If you don't have one way to do it, you'll find another way, and that's why when a child makes a little boat out of a little stick that they carve out and put a little thing on it. It's the gift that we save for 30 years. Because we know they couldn't just go whip out a credit card and buy something. Nothing wrong with that. But we know that their heart, their little heart was driven to give. It's so funny to me that sometimes we'll say things like this. We'll say, if God would show me exactly what to do, man, I would do it. And then we have a problem with the tithe. For once, he shows us exactly what to do, and then we act like we don't know what to do with it. So God has given us magnificent steps towards building our faith in the area that, in my opinion, displays the heart of true Christianity more than any other. There are philosophies out there and religions whose primary concern is self-discipline. Discipline yourself and avoid sin. Discipline yourself. There's others who focus on self-reflection, building up your philosophical mind and so forth. And notice the pattern already is self the Christian faith, like no other, is one about selflessness. Giving is about finding joy in pleasuring another, in helping another, 
and expressing to another. There is the work of giving. Some of it's hard work like prayer. Some of my prayer is just plain fun. You worship and you rejoice with God, you laugh with God, you talk to him like your best friend. But some of it's hard work. It's getting in there battling for your son, your daughter, fighting for something that matters. In your... And same with giving. There's an aspect of giving that's work. We've got to take care of responsibilities that carry God's work upon the earth. If you take the church out of our society, folks, I don't even want to use the word that comes to mind as to what's left. Because we are, use your own word, we're in trouble. As it is, we are struggling with a culture that is disintegrating right before our eyes. And there is nothing to counter it but the light of Jesus Christ in his people and in his church. Why was he so adamant about her? Why did he speak about his church in such a powerful and personal way? He called us his body, his representation on this earth. Now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to rulers and principalities and he basically invested his entire plan. Oh, he went to the cross and he rose from the dead. But all of that was to invest in the carrying on of God's giving onto the earth through his church. Through us corporately as a community of people and then through us individually as followers of Jesus Christ in our daily walk. It really comes down to that, folks. If you are not a giver, you're not a Christian. You're something else. In a secular society, I'm always enthused to see when secular individuals get ignited to the principles of giving. When billionaires like Gates and Buffett decided to throw in billions of dollars, you could argue and say, oh, tax write-off. You could say whatever you want to criticize. I was thrilled. Because somewhere in the heart, there is something inside that was wired to open up only when we give. And in reward for that, there would be the kind of reward that you cannot measure any other way. Pastor Marco brought out some of the concept of the literal physiology that goes on and the release of that physiology. I'm sure he was tempted to go way further in that because he hit a vein, he hit information there that is crucial. And sometimes we act like there's no reward. How many people like paying your taxes? Raise your hand. Well, did you know that Jesus said to give unto Caesar what is Caesar's? And to give unto God what is God? Let me tell you what I don't like. I don't like when our society taxes us more than they should, but I love taxes. Because without them, we have no military to protect us. Without them, we have no streets that can get us there. Without them, we have no internet inf infrastructure. You see, we take a lot of things for granted and we act as if tithing or taxes are money thrown down the tubes. They are not. There are tangible rewards that we get all the time and take for granted. God is protecting our children in intersections. God is blessing our home. God is keeping our job. God is protecting our position. God is opening up stuff for us five years down the road, and we don't even see and connect the dots. And there are those who struggle over and over and over again because they do not grasp the basic core of our faith. The basic core of our faith is to give and to serve. And replacing that is the artificial concept of attending a church. The rituals that man comes up with to make us feel as somehow we've touched God as we hand you a wafer. Or somehow as you are introduced to a song that you can't possibly sing with your heart. Because he's not in your heart. And so you measure worship services by the beat, by the ethnicity of the songs, by how well they perform them, because worship is not in you unless you're a giver. 
And the giver couldn't care less how the beat goes because they already got their worship going on. Because giving is worship. Worth-ship. Worth-ship. How much is he worth to you? I know how much Panasonic is worth to me. I know how much Samsung is worth to me. But when they are worth more than the favor and the blessing of God, something's wrong in my house. So just in case there was any argument, God so loved the world that he didn't just talk theology. He gave it all. His best for me. That then sets the tone for my response. My response is not ludicrous. My response is not irrational. And anybody who comes along and tries to fleece me, I'm going to be very aware because the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom. There is one place in the Bible, in the book of Acts, where the apostles put out a call. Everybody sold everything they had. Did you know that? If you don't like tithing, try this one. Because this is in the New Testament. And they sold everything they had, and they brought it to the apostles' feet. Sounds like a big old cult, doesn't it? And yet the Christian church was established with that mindset because there's a difference between laws that last and laws that, that pass. Strategies are not the same as principles. That was a strategy. The principle was that everything I have is God's. And some people will take advantage of that that particular strategy and use it to manipulate people and they lose the sense of the principle. I don't have to bring all I have and dump it at the feet of anybody as long as all I have is his right here where it belongs. But there's got to be something that demonstrates my obedience. So God in his infinite wisdom began a process built on the concept of covenant. The covenant goes like this. A covenant is this. And where the best marriages on earth are built in covenant mentality, not necessarily just in contracts. I always crack up about prenups and things like that. God bless you. But in my house, in my marriage, all I have is yours. And all she has is mine. You see, that's a covenant mentality. So what did God do? He took Adam and Eve. This is before Melchizedek. He took Adam and Eve and he places them in the garden. And he says, look around you. Everything I have here is for you. Everything I have is yours. Except don't touch this tree. Because there's always going to be something that God is going to establish that is not yours to touch. That is not yours to tamper with. And that was in my mind the beginning of the tithing concept. We have been touching that tree and not realizing we are literally bringing things into our lives. And I'm not talking about God's retribution. Let me tell you something about my God. My God doesn't beat you up because you fail to obey. My God does not bring plagues on your house or mine. That's not the God we serve. That's some preacher trying to manipulate and use God to scare you to death or scare you to doing something. That's not our God. And by the way, God doesn't even command us to give, but nor does he command us to drink water. But if you don't, you become dehydrated. Consequences come. And so consequences of our disobedience have been following humanity all of these years. And I will tell you, surrounded by a congregation of people who will say, preach it, Bishop, that when you obey God and when you do what he says, he will not only protect you, he will not only give you the high moments, but when you are in that valley, he will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. This world is a series of challenges. I don't care who you are. Life comes at you nonstop. It's fallen nature, the fallen fracture of humanity. It, is, it couldn't care less if your kid is cute. The circumstances will come and wipe that kid right out of, just as quick as anything else. There's no emotion in the process. 
The only emotion is in the heart of God is trying to protect his children. He's trying to bless us and cover us and protect us, but he cannot do what we will not allow of him. And he will not. And so he's given us his word and his principles and taught us his ways. And in that, he began to teach us that when you bring the first portion, when you take the first, the tithe means the tenth, and it was an actual measure, almost like instead of the hard work of being led by the Holy Spirit, because quite frankly, that's where I find myself constantly saying, Lord, lead me to the bigger thing. You've already covered this. I'm already a faithful tither in the sense of contributing to your house and so forth. But that's not enough because God has much more for us to do. Whether it's, you know, yesterday I was blowing my neighbor's leaves and everything and, and he, cause he's sick and all that. And I thought to myself, this is giving, isn't it? This is giving. And so instead of thinking about how fast I can do it, I begin to find some pleasure in doing it. Whatever you do that reflects the giving hand of God, God then uses that to respond in kind and to bring blessing unto you. It's a very rich philanthropist. He gives a lot of money to charity, and they asked him, he said, you know, how in the world can you give so much and still have so much left over? He said, well, here's how I see it. I take what I have and I shovel it out, and then God shovels it back, and his shovel's just way bigger. <laughs> Can I give God? Can I give him? How many stories that Jesus tried to introduce to us? Man was given two talents, another was given five, another given ten, he was given, and he shows one. And it's always the one with the smallest amount because God can only trust them with the smallest amount. And they hide it under a rock while the other invested it, got it involved, used it, helped other people with it. God is constantly trying to show us to get our head out of the sand. It has absolutely nothing to do with the measure of my bank account or yours. Nothing. There is nothing in that Bible that says that people with a lot of resources are better off and better able to worship God in their giving than people who don't have a lot. Nothing. Not one thing. As a matter of fact, Jesus bragged about the little lady with the two little coins. She couldn't buy a cup of coffee with two little coins but she got recorded in the Bible. She attracted the attention of the master because that's what he's drawn to, folks. Not what we think always. So our faith, our Christianity, is basically trying to reflect something different to our culture. And again, I believe that the Christian faith is woven into our society despite the numbers that are changing and the numbers that are going down and so forth, but still we are so woven into the American society and the American culture. So when a basketball player takes part of their wealth and builds a school for kids, I have a feeling there's some Jesus in that. And corporations are motivated to do more than just build and sell the widgets. I believe that there's some God woven into that because there are companies like Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby and many others that give away huge amounts of money and set a tone and set a pace for others to follow. I believe there's a power in the principle of giving and that there is certainly a purpose. And once we understand that faith is what God uses, are you hearing me this morning, faith is what God requires. You can come to church that doesn't require faith. That requires a Honda Civic. It doesn't require any big faith. We can all come, we can do it. Faith is required by the works that we do. James said this very clearly, faith without what, help me out. Faith without works is dead. It's talk, it has no power. It has very, very little purpose. And so we then demonstrate what we believe by what we do. 
And so comes God's principles of tithing, offerings, vows, gifts, and I could take a whole session just on serving, as you well know. But tithing is to establish a baseline relationship, to say, I'm in this covenant with you because what God does is this. When I give God that first tenth, that first part of what comes in my hand, recognizing that, yeah, I'm a little annoyed that the government wants to take more than their fair share. If they manage things properly, they wouldn't need 40%. They wouldn't need 30%. They wouldn't need all that. And I get angry and frustrated by that, but I still want to make sure I'm not negligent in my contribution to my community and to my civic duty. It's, there is a certain measure that's due Caesar, but he says, give unto God what is God's. How would I even know that if he didn't establish something to measure that by? Well, ultimately, I don't think the goal, as Pastor Mike said, is ultimately just the tenth. It's this guy. It's the fullness of my ambitions, the fullness of my dreams, the fullness of my materialistic mindset. It's the fullness of my plans and purposes and what I invested. Jesus said where your heart is, that's where your treasure is going to be. Period. Plain and simple. And so once we understand this, we understand that God has given us the faith to cross the bridge between what he requires and how we think. Jesus came along, Pastor Marco said, and he said, you've heard that it was said, but now I say. That's why he confirms in Matthew 23, 23, he confirms you ought to be doing this. But I see no big emphasis, you know why? Because he's only got a short period of time to elevate us to the true goal that was intended all along. In the beginning, it wasn't that God wanted to slap our hand away from a tree. He wanted to teach us what is his and what is not, what is good for us and what is not good for us. And once he establishes that principle, the lifestyle of faith begins to kick in. You begin to feel it, see it, you begin to talk about it. And then it creates a faith that allows you to go into other areas like when you're sick or when you're looking for a job or whatever it might be. And if there's nothing in that faith bank, so to speak, there's nothing to draw from when you need it, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but just raising children alone requires a lot of faith and a lot of favor from God. What happens when you don't have it? You see, you're thinking you don't have it when you don't have money, and I'm saying you don't have it when you don't have obedience, My mom and dad were a perfect example of that. My dad, my, my, we had five kids. My dad worked a simple manual job. My dad wasn't a Christian. As a matter of fact, he was an anti-Christian. One day we got, he got saved after a bad car accident we should have been killed in. We survived the accident. Not only survived it, not a scratch on us. The car was d d obliterated. He went to church, got saved. I'm not going to say my father ended up singing for the Lord, all, but the one thing he got after that was the principle of tithing. Some of you who've been here for years know the story. Five of us went through the finest schools in America with no money in the bank. We worked two jobs. We worked summers. We did our part. But God just gave us favor and blessed us, all five. Doctors, lawyers, ministers, all different kinds of things because they were faithful. My little mom would take money, and because my dad, before he got saved, he wouldn't let her touch any money. She, had no, she took care of us. That was her job. So she'd go babysit on the side and, and take that money and secretly give it to the work. She'd send it to Oral Roberts. She'd send it to one of them ministries or whatever. Or she had this thing where she would go in, and she wouldn't sew his pockets. So change would fall. I am, I am serious. Change would fall out of his pockets into the seat. She'd snag that, and she would give it to the church. Unbelievable. Is it possible we're sitting in this room because of a little woman with no hair, but a lot of faith? Is it possible?
For some reason, I can't to this day still explain. My dad just had an absolute rock solid concept of tithing. And time and time again, God just honored and blessed it in ways, scholarships and different things and so many different ways. It's carried us through all these years. We built this church based on principles and the concepts we learned. God purposely made sure that we were as broke as you could possibly get so that we could not take credit and give it to anyone else. God started this ministry with absolutely nothing but that thing I call faith, a little bit of obedience, and other people who themselves stood up to that same kind of measure of a little bit of faith, a little bit of obedience, and a lot of hard work. It's never changed, folks. Anybody can come and sit in a theater and say, wow, but you see, somebody had to build America. Somebody had to build those roads. Somebody had to build the infrastructure that allows us to talk and communicate. Someone has to pay the price. And I just don't want to be the guy sitting in the room taking. All my life, taking from what other people build. Because there are various laws that operate in the kingdom of God. Let me give you a couple of these things. I wrote them down. This is what I call the law of responsibility. The law of responsibility is that everybody should contribute. What's the, what does the Bible say? You don't work, you don't eat. We have a wave of children today who basically want to dictate to us. Well, you have to work that out for yourself. All I know is that in my house, if you don't work, I tell you to clean your room and you don't clean it, there's not going to be a whole lot of reward in my loving heart because that's what love is. Okay? The law of contribution means I'm an American, and as an American... I don't need the government to pick up every paper in front of me. I can clean up my, that sidewalk myself too. As an American, I'm going to pray for my country instead of spending all my time just online bashing my presidents. As an American, I'm going to pay whatever reasonable fair tax is mine to pay and thank God I live in a country that doesn't take more like most of Europe or is not ready to disintegrate like Venezuela or other places around the world. Because that's my fair share. And at almost 60 years old, if there was a call and they're willing to accept men who are almost 60 years old, I would change this uniform and go to fight. It's part of our duty. It's a law of responsibility. And irresponsible kids become irresponsible adults. And irresponsible adults become baggage for the rest of us to carry. That's why if you go and look in the Bible, Ananias and Sapphira, everybody sold stuff. Ananias did, but they held back for themselves. It was not because God wanted to penalize them as such. It's because they broke the law of responsibility in that particular moment. Everyone was responsible to what God had revealed so clearly. Most of the time, none of that is upon us. Most of you don't have any of that. Let me tell you something. When we were building this church and I put out a call there, I can't tell you how much to this day I still appreciate these faces scattered around this room, how they rose to the occasion. There's people who sold their second cars to help build the seats you're sitting in and buy those seats. They sensed it. They got it, the law of responsibility. We did a lot of pledges. We did a lot of extra offerings. I don't do as many now. Why? We don't need it the same way we used to. So I'm not going to create an artificial giving dynamic. But the law of responsibility is there. So you see, I'm always proud when I hear the angel trees have been snapped up. I'm always proud when I hear that on Wednesday night you bring some stuff and you come and show a little bit of respect. In my opinion, the place should be packed when such a call goes out. But the truth of the matter is, it's a work in progress that little by little we all have to buy into for ourselves. The law of attitude. 2 Corinthians, God loves a cheerful giver. 
man, the last thing I want to do is give because I'm, you know, I'm either forced to or embarrassed to or whatever. Some of you in this room have been to those years ago, those services where they would embarrass you into giving. Okay? No, they try to do it the positive way. All those with 10000 for the pledge stand up now and they would, well, what if you don't have 10000 for the pledge? What if I only have a few hundred dollars and I'd like to participate? Well, by the time they get to me, I look like the loser in the house. See, we wipe away all that foolishness. We get down to just this principle of cheerful giving. God never intended us to just to ignore the tithe nor to stop there, but to grow beyond that and to be led by the Holy Spirit in ways that are very personal and very private between me and God. Most of what I give any longer, you can never see it. Nobody will ever know except my wife. They don't need to. They shouldn't. It's between me and God, you see. But the law of attitude determines how we do this. If you're begrudging, if you're thinking, oh, the church just wants my money, but you know what? Church doesn't need your money. The truth of the matter is what we have learned around here. If you think you can't make it on that 90%, I got news for you right now. You'll never make it on 100. What I found out is making 90% being allowed to be kept by me in the hands of God, 90% that I get to keep, but I'm in the hands of God, that I'm in, I have his favor behind me. My goodness, watch me blow by you. And many of us have learned these principles over the years. Think about a principle that doesn't work. A principle that doesn't work loses gas. Have you ever wondered how they could still sell a product on TV everyone knows doesn't work? If it did, I'd be handing out testosterone bottles for ageless male for free to all the guys in this church. That was the best I can come up with, so give me a break. This is spontaneous. I'm just saying, if certain things don't work, after a while, you probably don't want to do them, right? That's why God said, test me in this. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. If you go to Malachi chapter 3, it is the only place in the Bible God says, test me in this. Now, you got to say that with an attitude. Okay? Don't read that all wussy. You know, Test me in this, says the Lord. No, no. It's kind of like a God who's tired of being questioned. Like, okay, if you can't just believe me because I'm God, then test me in this. That's how I read it. <laughs> because he is so desperate to show off to his children. And he needs mechanisms to do that. He doesn't just use the tithe. When you pray for your child and they have a fever, don't you think he wants to use that moment as well? But you have to build the infrastructure of faith in your life. And if you blow these little, simple, low-bar things, when the harder things come along, it's going to be too much. Now, maybe sometimes God's grace is there and it kind of gives you that kind of shortcut. Maybe he wants to show you in this area that you should be doing all this and God's grace. But don't build your relationship with God that on that, build it on obedience. Okay? That's what he's really looking for. So the law of attitude kind of establishes the way you approach this. So the law of accountability is in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, what? Much is expected. Well, I don't have much. Well, let me tell you something about you don't have much. You want to go around the world, and I'll show you what doesn't have much. Okay? You go around the world. Oh, China's ready to catch us. Oh, my God, they're right behind us in their economy. you got to be kidding. China's not even close. China's never going to catch us. They're never going to catch us. They have a flawed infrastructure of belief. That flawed infrastructure belief will never catch a society that believes in God, even if it's down to 20%. Most people in these countries are dirt poor, living in these little tiny rooms with six or seven, eight people. 
all around the world, most places. Look how these people, listen, I'm a rule of law guy and I don't want to just open the gates to everyone who comes to America, but it does break your heart to see how much people want to come to a place we criticize all the time. Right? Because they recognize, oh my God, give me the crumbs off your complaining table. Why do you think the Salvation Army stands outside of Best Buy and places like that? Because they're just willing to take the crumbs and do a lot with it, quite frankly. Okay. The law of accountability says when you walk out of it, you just drop 500 bucks on a game that's probably not even good for you anyway because it fosters violence. You can't give them 50 bucks. So we just throw in whatever's left over. You see, these are, these are the kinds of things God wants us to address as a Christian people. There's an accountability. And then there is the next one, which actually is cl quite close, which is the law of sowing and reaping. I love the law of sowing and reaping. I remember when I was a kid, I used to believe that the law of sowing and reaping was bad. It was against me. If you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, there is certainly a negative side to it. There is a consequential side to it. But I have learned since that God was offering that as a gift, that when we do this, this is what God wants to do, law of sowing and reaping. Can I say something that seems a little bit odd? I'm going to say something. This is not an any conflict of anything you've heard. But I will say this, when we talk about we need to give in a way that there's no expectation of a reward or a response, I'm here to tell you that's not totally true. It is just basically true. In other words, when I give in humanity, I'm less concerned that people see my giving, I'm less concerned and you know what, I'm giving out of love and so forth. And there's a certain amount of purity to that. But let me tell you something. I always expect a reward for my giving. Let me break, let me break this down, be, be patient. The Bible gives us so many promises about the rewards that come from obedience. But I have to remember the law of attitude. My attitude can't be giving to get wrong attitude. But when I'm using my faith, I have to recognize that even when I give something to my daughter, the pleasure of her smile is a reward. Now, how many of you have given it to a child who looks at your gift and throws it aside and runs that way to the other? How many have done that? How did you feel? You didn't like it. You shopped and you went around, you bought stuff, and they gave you no reward. I don't give, what, I, what I'm saying is I will give anyway. The reward is not the motivator, but I give with an expectation. Now, more importantly is not that example. The more important is the spiritual example. The law of sowing and reaping guarantees to me that whatever I sow, it says in Galatians, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man will reap, or a woman, of course, what they sow. Well, let me turn it around and use that promise because I know that that works in terms of sin. Let me use it in terms of obedience. So when I give to someone, and in my heart, I feel I want to be benevolent and give, I'm not giving because they're going to reward me, but I know they're going to reward. I'm going to get a reward. I expect a reward. I believe for a reward. Whether it comes in the way, you see, here's the thing, why the attitude is important. I don't ever need to see the reward. I need to believe the reward. The reward can come in my grandchild 20 years from now. So, yes, the attitude we take in the giving is not necessary to get, but my faith has elevated to a place where I believe that whatever I sow in a good sense is going to reap back unto me. But also when God whispers into my heart and into my ear, help that person, help that situation, and I don't do it, I will reap that too. If you don't have a certain amount of faith expectation attached to your giving, why in the world would you give? Why? We have a lot of things going on, a lot of challenges. We live in a very expensive part of the country. So why would I do that? 
why would I take 10% of what I make and give it to, and, and why? I don't even know you that well. I don't even know what you do at half the time. I have to believe that there is a heavenly reward that blankets my home, sealing this covenant thing, because I know he will never break his end of the covenant, so the only question in heaven and earth is, will I keep my end? But when I keep my end, even in the smallest way, heaven responds to it, and I expect that and rejoice in it and thank him, never needing to tangibly, necessarily see it. I got news for you. But he has allowed me and allowed many of us to see it time and time again. That job you had no business getting, but God gave it to you anyway. That's it. You see, that's why the devil comes along and puts a supervisor in your job, and he's a bit of a jerk. And you let him take that job from you. Well, I couldn't work there. That was maybe a mission, man. You were called to reach that. I gave you that job. See, because if we're not practicing the Christian faith in all its dynamics, which is not just giving, it is serving. Which is not just serving, it is forgiving. It's not just forgiving, it is prayer. It is not just prayer, it is coming together and encouraging each other. All of these dynamics create a dynamic environment that sends people out with a generous heart. So when your boss is a jerk, generosity is not just you're paying his rent. It is now you're giving him grace. You're praying for him behind his back, not talking behind his back. That's part of generosity. What a world this would be, right? What was that? The law of sowing and reaping. Galatians chapter 6. You can go read that later, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. A giving man will prosper, Psalms 11, 5. These are all promises. I have tons of them. I'm not going to read to you. Go find them for yourself. There are plenty of them. And then there's the law of honor. The law of honor. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruit of all your crops. Now, I don't know a lot of farmers in here, but I think he's using that as a metaphor of whatever it is we have that comes into our life, whatever reward comes for whatever we sow. For a farmer, he sows seed, he gains crops. We sow an effort in knowledge and education, we gain a paycheck. The first fruit of that goes to the Lord. Usually with most people in this room, the first fruit in our life goes to the government. We have very little control because the government is not kind like the church. They just take it. Okay? So our attitude has to be a certain way, not necessarily as accountants, but more as obedient followers of Jesus Christ. The law of honor basically says, Lord, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor you. It's a kind of worship that God recognizes very distinct. Let me give you an example. When Jesus said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar and to, and to God what is God, that was a law of honor. And he wasn't just saying honor the church, he was saying honor the secular component of your life as well. When Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you in Luke chapter six, pressed down, shaken together, running over, that was the law of sowing and reaping. When Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. That was the law of attitude. When Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with little will be trusted with more. Spiritual things is what he's really talking about. That was the law of responsibility. Do you see that? Let's turn to that that verse. Turn over to Luke 16. Let me read this to you. Luke 16, verse 10. Whoever can be trusted with very little, very little. Notice the very. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest, notice the word dishonest, with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, just to make sure nobody thinks this is a metaphor. Who will trust you with true riches? 
True riches like wisdom. True riches like insight, faith, love. True riches like self-control. True riches, riches like kindness. True riches like favor. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other, because you cannot serve both God and money. Another translation says mammon, which is really identifying the spirit behind it. The spirit behind it. Jesus tried to convey to them about the secrets of the kingdom. I'll read this to you in Matthew 13, 11. Go back and look at it later. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has, listen to this, whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever has what? Based on the context of the parable of the sower, whoever has basically invested what little they have and trusted God in that process will have more and they will have an abundance. Malachi said prophetically, which is why Malachi is not just under the law of the Old Testament. Malachi, if you go read it, is prophesying into the future. He says, will a man rob God? How are you robbing me? Through tithes and offerings. He said, test me in this so I can pour out so much. He said, I want to pour out so much blessing upon you. I'm paraphrasing. I want to open the windows of heaven and pour out. On, why? Why? So that we could be fatter, we could have more, we could have, No. So that God can now not only be a blessing to us, but through us. That's what he said to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. Abraham. I'm going to bless you. Then he said, and I'm going to be a blessing through you. That's the goal. That's why he's trying to do that. And he goes back and says, I'm giving you the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom. Do you want to know that some of these things aren't real secrets of the kingdom? Some of the things you and I are supposed to do are not secrets of the kingdom. You find a good money manager, and I would encourage you to do that instead of Uncle, Uncle Floyd, who's got the big idea, and invest in the laws of compound interest will start to work. That's why I'm a big advocate of saving. I'm a big advocate of education, a big advocate of training, big advocate of all those. Those aren't secrets of the kingdom. Secular people can do that, but guess what? If secular people do that, why aren't we doing that? So we need to learn the full package of healthy living, which is to master secular principles, but then to embrace the secrets of the kingdom. Things that don't make sense to the accountant. Unless God makes sense to that accountant. Okay. Okay. The secrets of the kingdom are the ways God thinks. Somebody preached a sermon once, I would love to copy the title called The Upside Down Kingdom. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, now I say. That's the way you normally think. Now let me show you how I think. You've heard that it was say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the way the world thinks. Now let me tell you what I think. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy as yourself. The kingdom of God does not operate completely like the secular world. And I have both of them to learn from and both of them to respect to a certain extent. Caesar and God. Principles of this world at work and principles of the kingdom that work even better. And that way we don't become these goofy little Christians who just run around talking about faith. Oh, I'm just believing God because I... No. You can't just believe God because God expects you to do all you can do to stand and to do what you need to do. If you're lazy and you're not going to work, you're not going to be blessed. Okay? If you're 
open to scams and you have enough, not even common sense to just stop answering the phone, you're gonna be broke. There's gotta be principles that we operate in before we then tap into the dynamics of the heavenly principles of God. And let me just wind this down, folks. Jesus said, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. And he's saying there's just so many people who don't hear what they have heard, so to speak. But I will tell you, he basically was honest and said, blessed are your eyes and blessed are your ears. You know why? Because there's a lot of other people who do listen, a lot of other people who do obey. And thank God for those people, whether in the church or in our civil society or in our families or wherever it might be. Thank God for a father or a mother who has held that family together, a grandmother who has held that family together and passed down those principles. So I'm gonna tell you, I don't believe, as much as we wanna be sweet and nice and everything, but I don't believe You know, I was telling the guys, they were both trying to elevate the principle from the, the simplicity of tithing, you know, and not letting it become a legalistic part of your life and all that. And they were trying so hard to elevate the conversation. Love, generosity, those things. And I applaud them totally for doing that. But I'll tell you how it all struck me watching live stream. I look around a room of people who aren't even tithing. Most of them aren't even tithing. I'm not sure how much time I want to waste elevating. You need to start doing the basics. Amen. Or you're screwed. Amen. Or you're screwed. Make it plain. I'm just telling you. I'd rather the inheritance my little daddy gave me with no high school education and my mama that has passed on and created a life of generosity and a life of faith than all the millions a rich person is going to hand on and their kids know nothing about God. And I don't care if this church goes down to 300 people. There are going to be 300 who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and want to live on the word of God. And it's time you stop breaking the laws of participation and responsibility and attitude and honor. It's time this house get in line. All the jumping around in the world, all the come Holy Spirit in the world will never happen until we're obedient and faithful with the little. Please pardon me, but do not ignore me. And I guarantee you, believe me, when we came here early on, there were only a couple of churches worth going to in this whole region. Now I can count about 10 or 12 of them. Plenty of places for us to go now. I'm just telling you, I'm nearing a portion of my ministry in my life where I am not interested in shows, in performance, in playing games, in rituals, in religion, without a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And there is no relationship with Jesus Christ without obedience, period. And I'm not going to get old around here watching you people fall apart because you didn't hear what I was saying because we were too nice. I want to be nice. But right now, nice and love is to tell you it's time to obey the word of God. And if you do not trust my motivations, then go somewhere else and do it. Do it faithfully. Because then you'll have no reason. Okay? And I want to applaud some of you. I cannot tell you how blown away after almost 28 years of this with you guys and people who have been faithful and faithful, and faithful, and faithful. 
when they can barely buy themselves some shoes and they're sitting there honoring God and I say, Lord God, I'm also going to shift into praying for greater reward for those who are faithful than ever before. You wait to see what happens in the next two years. Reward is coming to this house. You miss it, that's on you. But it's coming. And God is going to honor your faithfulness. And he's going to honor it in ways that matter most to you. And most of you are not interested in just upsizing your car. You're interested in that cousin getting saved who's going to hell right now. That you're interested in your neighbor who you've been working on for years. You're interested in that cancer being able to, we have faith to speak to that thing. And it's like moves the mountain of it. You're interested in what matters. God's going to respond. You young people, take your little whatever it is you make out there, doing whatever it is you do for a little bit of money, and make sure the first portion is the Lord's. Amen. Okay? You learn how to walk in faith. Then when you come here and you express yourself in adoration to God and you jump before him, there's something about it that's valid and tangible. Put your hands to the plow. Don't be lazy. Get out there and work. Help your parents. Make sure you're a vital part of your home. When you go out into the workplace, contribute. Don't just take. And you will see. Your faith will turn into a force. Powerful. God chooses donkeys like me for a reason. Because he wants to make sure he didn't choose the valedictorian who can then think they're so smart. That's why it happened. He chooses simple folk because we then give the glory to him. And so if you're tired of my old stories about how God has blessed this house, I'm sorry, they're all the stories I got. But they're all the stories that God is here. And I want us to stand for a moment together. I haven't been here for a while, so I went a little longer. I'll go longer still. I'll go away, and you won't see me for a while. But for God's sake, folks, I wish you understood. I left 80 degrees. There's one thing 80 degrees doesn't do for you. Doesn't love you like your church. Let's pray. And Lord, I pray the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The blessing, Lord God, that you We're motivated by to send your son for me, for we, for all of us, for people who spit on your name. You sent your son for them. Your giving was out of the utter pregnancy of your love. You're more than generous. You are God. Father, how can I go wrong? If our little theology is even flawed, even by 10% or 1% or whatever, how can I go wrong in trying to do good for others? How can we go wrong in trying to support your work upon the earth? Lord, I'm well aware there are folks in this house right now that literally can't even exactly do what we're saying today, but I pray that they will start. Start in the kind of obedience that you measure the most, which is the attitude of the heart. And Lord, for others who put big offerings in there, but they've left their heart behind, maybe they need to keep that offering for a while and get their heart right. But Father, we dedicate our businesses to you because we honor you. We dedicate our families and our homes to you 
We dedicate every resource we have. As Pastor Marco said over and over again last week, I'm the least. I'm the, I'm the one who needs to listen to this message. Good. That means our hearts are right. And I declare your blessing over your children, over my family, this family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Father, forgive us of our sin. We didn't mean to sin. We didn't mean to be greedy or stingy or afraid, but sometimes we grew up not having and we're afraid to lose what little we've worked for. Lord, we didn't mean to directly offend you, but life has closed in and cut off some opportunities. We're not exactly sure how this is going to work. But forgive us for not trusting you the way we should have or the way we used to, maybe. And I pray for those who are new among us, Lord, that they just listen with an open heart. They have no reason to feel guilt, no reason to feel conviction, but I pray they simply listen with an open heart. This may be the first time they've heard such things. And then, Lord, I pray that blessing will transcend down to our little kids running around into the future of what you've called us to do. What do you want us to do, Father? And sometimes in silence, we judge you and we judge each other. But what if you are waiting for this house to display the kind of obedience that is required for the next downloading of heavenly vision? Is it a school? Is it education? Is it missionary ventures? Is it, what is it, Father? But Lord, I will tell you this. We're not going to speculate on what we don't know when we haven't done what we know. And so we pray and we offer you a fresh dedication in this house today. Fresh dedication to be generous wherever we can. I pray in Jesus' name. And let us say amen and amen. Praise the Lord.